My name's Hannah Fleming um, and I'm one of the curators here. Before the museum existed, these buildings functioned as working almshouses for 200 years and they were founded by a man called Robert Jeffrey, who was a big figure in the City of London and he'd been master of the Company of Ironmongers, one of the city livery companies. At the beginning of the 20th century, the London County Council stepped in, bought the site, preserved the buildings and opened the gardens to the public in 1912. Where did the inspiration come from for the museum? Yeah. Um, as we walk around, I mean, it's fascinating. There was a plan for it to be a furniture museum to reflect the local trade, which was the furniture trade which had grown up around here. At the same time that the London County Council was opening this museum, it was also actually demolishing quite a lot of other properties. And so they were ending up with a lot of architectural salvage from houses, things like stairways, doors, door knockers, balconies that they didn't know what to do with. And by the time the museum opened, its displays were always much broader than just furniture. So can you tell me something about the layout, how we walk from room to room, yeah. you know, the areas yeah. that we're going through? So what's really nice, I think, about the museum is we have a very straightforward chronology. So we start off with our first room in 1630, and it's a merchant's hall in a London townhouse. You'll walk through the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th centuries and end up in the 1990s in a converted warehouse apartment in Shoreditch. Each room represents the main living space in the home of a middling or middle-class Londoner. Right. And then in the 1990s, the museum had a new extension built, which hooks onto the corner of the almshouses. And as we walk into that section of the museum, then you'll come to the 20th century rooms. So the final room, the 1990s um, converted warehouse, there were a lot of industrial warehouses mm. that were falling into disuse. So hence why they became residential apartments. What can you tell me about the room we're currently standing in? So we're standing in a 1745 parlour. We're in the middle of the 18th century in a London townhouse. Nothing post dates 1745, everything is an original object from that time. And the parlour would have been the room where you could have some meals, you might have dined in here, but also where you would have socialised, where your friends and acquaintances oh, okay. would have come and you could have drunk tea. So the middling sorts at this point are quite focused on the idea of politeness. It's a sort of code of behaviour that governs everything that you do. Your behaviour, your sort of deportment, your conversation, and also how you actually furnish your room. Um, things aren't supposed to be too gaudy, too elaborate. There's supposed to be a sort of element of restraint. One interesting story is with the um, porcelain tea bowls and saucers. Those particular tea bowls and saucers were part of a huge cargo um, of porcelain put onto a Chinese junk that was sailing to Europe and it sunk off the coast of Vietnam in a place called Car Mau in about 1725 and lay undisturbed for hundreds of years and then the wreck was found by some Vietnamese fishermen, I think, um, and brought up to the surface and auctioned off in the 1990s you'll find lots and lots of that porcelain in museums all over the world. Oh, what a fantastic yeah. story, isn't and it? What's, what's really nice is that for the middling sorts, sort of people the museum yeah. was interested in, they would have had lots and lots of bits of porcelain like that. As I walked along the corridor, I noticed the chapel. The chapel was part of the original almshouse buildings. And that would have been quite common for almshouses to um, have had a chapel. And the pensioners that lived here were obliged to attend service every Sunday or they could be fined. It's got a monument to Robert Jeffrey, the almshouse's founder in there. When he died, he was buried in his local church, um, St Dionys on Lime Street, which was a Wren church. But then when that was demolished in the 19th century, the monument to him was moved and came here, and his body and that of his wife were also moved and they're now buried um, in a small graveyard in the gardens here. One of the things I found as I walked around and looked at the dates, you explain what happened in that era. The idea is that you're getting to see these rooms in context. So as you walk past the rooms, you can see, you know, what's changing in terms of interior decoration and furniture history. But really, it's also about social history and people's lives and what's going on in the world around them and how that affects how they live at home. And that's the story we're interested in. Up until probably the middle of the 20th century, most of the objects you'll see on display in the museum have been purchased. From the mid-20th century onwards, then we rely very heavily on donations. Okay. Um, because we're particularly interested in the personal stories behind objects, who bought them, how they felt about them, how they were used in their home, what their home was like, all those stories, that's what we really want to get from people to understand how people lived at home. Mm -hmm.